Hello and welcome to another Anarchism Research Group video. Today we're talking to Alex Christianopoulos of Loughborough University about his work on Leo Tolstoy. Please hit subscribe, like and share this video. My name is Alex Christianopoulos. I'm a senior lecturer in politics and international relations at Loughborough University and I fairly recently published uh, a book on Tolstoy's political thought called Tolstoy's political thought, Christian anarcho-pacifist iconoclasm then and now. The book is structured in five main chapters, plus introduction and conclusion, of course. The five main chapters look at Tolstoyan anarchism, Tolstoyan pacifism, anti-clericalism, asceticism, and uh, activism. And what each of these chapters does is, after a kind of brief uh, setting up of the context, reminding people of the relevant context to do with anarchism in, in, in Russia at the time or pacifism at the time. It then probably spends about half of each chapter um, quoting fairly extensively Tolstoy and organizing, restructuring his, his thoughts. He never really wrote a single treatise to sort of spell everything out. He tries to systematize a bit uh, his political thought. And then it goes into criticisms either of Tolstoy directly or of the kind of views that he espouses. That's kind of the second main part of each chapter. And the third main part um, thinks about the relevance of those ideas beyond their context. And that might be either the impact of Tolstoy's ideas directly on a series of other people, perhaps, or um, the way in which his ideas are arguably still relevant for us today for all sorts of reasons, for example. So it's a kind of five-part kind of exposition. Um, uh, yeah, and I suppose, so Tolstoy's political thought is known for his uh, passionate pacifism, which is what leads him to his anarchism. And I've tried to deliberately separate the pacifism and the anarchism from the sort of non-violence or the advocacy of what to do about it kind of thing, which I called activism in there. And then on top of that, he's vehemently anti-clerical, so obviously that's why that uh, chapter's there. And then the chapter on asceticism is an opportunity to tackle his views on art, which are different in the latter part of his life to what they were before, his views on um, sex and marriage, and his views on sort of intoxicating indulgences, as he would see them, um, which kind of relates a bit to his anarchism, but that, that, that's the way the book is structured. There is a free, openly accessible short version of it. There's a chapter basically available in open access um, in the third volume of Essays in Anarchism and Religion and that's kind of, that can be downloaded in PDF online. It's kind of a taster of the main elements of the book apart from the asceticism. We do press on and are born every morning thankful for the sun. I think Tolstoy should be uh, read in anarchist theory or, or as a, an, an important anarchist thinker as well as uh, beyond just anarchist circles in uh, literature and, and, and so on for a number of reasons. He, he is, it's true, a, a slightly awkward anarchist and I'll come back to it in, in a few moments, but he's quite powerful in his writings, quite compelling in the way he condemns the state in particular for its violence, for the violence of the state. And so he will condemn a war and militarism and imperialism. He'll point to the kind of arms race element behind it. He'll criticize colonialism, etc. He'll be very critical of legislation, law and coercion, which he sees as a form of enslavement. He doesn't believe in um, the tyranny of the majority. He doesn't believe in uh, represents a democracy. He certainly doesn't believe in capital punishment. He's very critical of the judicial system. For him, we're all, all sinful, so we shouldn't be judging one another, and especially not kind of confining others to you know, years of imprisonment on the basis of uh, you know, uh, accusing them of sins that we perhaps are guilty of ourselves. He's critical of the economy and in particular kind of land seizure by a few, especially kind of alongside entire communities that have no land or, and, and would be perfectly able to work it to feed themselves. He's critical of the way in which the state is structured like a kind of pyramid, uh, that, uh, which the most cunning take control of. He's critical of uh, the hypocritical elite gestures, so the gestures that elites put forward to try and apparently attenuate some of the problems of the state, and he doesn't buy any of that narrative about sort of international treaties and alliances, for example, to prevent war. He thinks these are clearly kind of alignments for the next war. 
One of the things I think he's quite original on, because a lot of that, I suppose, you find in other anarchists, although he says it, you know, it, with his own voice and he's quite compelling and interesting, but he also talks about kind of the way in which the state is so structured that it allows us all to kind of evade our responsibility. So you have kind of the kind of argument that uh, Arendt develops later on about the banality of evil present in Tolstoy, how therefore each cog in the system kind of desists itself from moral responsibility for the violence inflicted by the system. And he's quite interesting on that. He's critical of patriotism, he's critical of um, the education system, and he he's very admirative of kind of the life of Russian peasants and manual labor. And so for all these reasons, a lot of what he says kind of echoes um, or adds to, contributes to anarchist thought both at the time and now. I mean, in the chapter, I discuss kind of criticisms of, of those views and the way in which it's relevant today. But just to kind of go back to your question, he's awkward with all of these labels. So he's an awkward pacifist because he's particularly extreme in his pacifism and many pacifists can't follow him as far as he goes. He's an awkward anarchist because of his commitment to nonviolence. He's so committed to it that you know, even though a lot of anarchists might be nonviolent or, or pacifists, not all by any measure, of course, but... But even those that are will find Tolstoy's commitment perhaps a bit too extreme. And of course, he's sort of a Christian anarchist, although his Christianity is quite awkward. It's very rationalistic. He doesn't buy uh, the miracles, the resurrection. He doesn't see the point in rituals. So he's an awkward Christian. And that's another one. He's an awkward Christian. He's a Christian, but an awkward one. He's, he likes uh, Jesus' morality, but he doesn't buy all the all the miracles and the, the mystical element of Christianity, etc. As I said, he dismisses the resurrection. So he's awkward with each of the labels that he has, even as an activist, as it were. He's not really an activist in the standard sense. He sort of writes from his uh, estate. He's still an aristocrat, even though he tries to give away as much as he can. So he's awkward with all these labels, and yet I think he's interesting and engaging. And many are people who've picked up um, a text of Tolstoy have not been unmoved by it. You may not find yourself fully committed to following him kind of all the way, uh, but he usually moves you and kind of triggers thought and reflection. And so for all those reasons, I think he's, he's worth reading uh, in anarchist circles and beyond. Tolstoy had a major impact in Russia in particular at the time. It, it, people don't necessarily know this now, but in the last 30 years, 30 years of his life, which is when he publishes all this Christian anarchist stuff, that's also the period when a lot of his uh, fiction gets translated and made available. And so it's actually in the same, in the same period that both his, both his fiction and his political thought become widely known. And so he's known as much for his political and religious views as he is for his fiction in, you know, in the period in which he articulates those more to the point and that's kind of internationally in Russia specifically he's seen as a, a major influence in corroding the um, authority moral and otherwise of the Tsar at the time some commentators talk of Tolstoy as being as powerful as the Tsar at the time except of course you know he doesn't hold political power but the the, the moral critique he articulated about the regime was felt by the regime. They didn't know how to persecute him. They persecuted his followers. But he was also um, someone that Lenin and his followers distrusted or you know were wary about because they wanted, of course, kind of the revolution they had in mind. And they thought Tolstoy was particularly uh, annoying in convincing many people of different methods, basically, of the kind of Tolstoyan path of not contributing to the ills of the world and therefore not taking part in any form of violence, revolutionary or top-down, um, which, of course, was kind of a, you know, a, um, a thorn on the sort of Leninist project, on the Leninist side. I mean, Lenin blames the failure of the 1905 revolution in part on the appeal of Tolstoyism at the time. So he's quite influential at the time, uh, and he's less so now, we know that late, less so now, in part because of the way the Stalinist regime reconfigured the way we know Tolstoy. So Tolstoy became someone widely read in the Soviet Union for his fiction. So Tolstoy, a brilliant patriot, someone who understood the soul of every Russian, who portrayed it so well in his broad canvases of Russian society. But Tolstoy, whose later writings can be dismissed as sort of the wacky thoughts of, uh, you know, uh, someone gone a bit too crackpot and, 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 and wild. And that kind of 
two-pronged way of looking at Tolstoy, you know, brilliant writer, but just sort of a bit naive and utopian for his political writings, has stuck, and it's stuck in Russia, and it's kind of been exported since. And yet, I think anyone who picks up his political and religious writings will see that, although, yes, perhaps he's quite sort of utopian, if you want, or uh, a bit extreme in, in his complete faith in the possibility of uh, the extermination of violence, for example, he still, again, moves you, he makes you think, and he's interesting, and that's precisely why uh, the Stalinist regime reconfigured his reputation that way, because that way he could be controlled in a sense. We will not forget nor abandon ourselves in the face of riot gear, fortified condos, and the ambitions of the rich. This book really started when I started my PhD, in a sense. The PhD at the beginning was going to be about Tolstoy's political thought and Tolstoy's Christian anarchism. At the time, I broadened it to Christian anarchism more generally for a number of reasons, one of which um, was that I thought that Tolstoy kind of ignores some important text that if you're trying to convince a Christian, you can't completely ignore. So, uh, Romans 13, Paul's saying uh, there, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And I quickly realized that a number of other Christian anarchists have pretty solid and convincing answers to those questions. And so when you put Tolstoy alongside a number of other Christian anarchist voices, you can put together a fairly convincing, I think, Christian anarchist exegesis. That is an interpretation of the gospel of the New Testament, which advocates a form of anarchism, to keep it broad. So at the time, that's what I did. So I that became the PhD. I kind of got that published. And ever since, I've been trying to go back to finishing that project on Tolstoy's political thought. And it's only you know, fairly recently that I finally kind of finished the, the book length study of it, though I've published a number of articles on, on Tolstoy's political thought uh, uh, anyway. And so um, one of the things I'm interested in with Tolstoy is his technique of defamiliarization, which is something that uh, it's, it's a kind of a literary technique that's often um, attributed to him. It's, it's, it's the art of making something familiar look new, as if seen for, as, the, uh, uh, as if for the first time through the eyes of a child, because in so doing he can portray things that we've come to assume are, are normal in ways that make you think, hang on, it really is a bit absurd and doesn't have to be that way. And I, I argue it's quite subversive for a number of reasons in, in a paper that's um, available, I think, well, it's only for free on my website. I don't know if it's available for free on the on the on the journal article on the journal's website itself. And um, I'm also about to publish uh, uh, an article on the way Tolstoy's, Tolstoy's thought influenced not just Eamon Hennessy in the Catholic Worker Movement, but also Dorothy Day, arguably the most important figure of the Catholic Worker Movement, someone who, after all, is on the path to canonization, might be turned into a saint, even though she said, don't call me a saint, I, want, don't want, I don't want to be dismissed that easily. Um, it turns out that Tolstoy has quite a lot of influence on her, quite a lot of impact on her, even though she tends to not want to acknowledge it all along. And that's something that's quite peculiar about Tolstoy, is even if you are influenced by him, often you don't acknowledge it as much because you don't want to have to deal with some of the other complicated questions about, say, his view on marriage or the way his um, his nonviolence is so extreme. And so people don't always acknowledge the way they've been influenced by him. And that's one thing uh, Dorothy Day does, for example. That said, I've done a lot of work on Christian anarchism and on Tolstoy. I'm trying to uh, branch into kind of other directions at the moment. But that's the way Tolstoy fits in my research so far. He's been there all along for the best part of 20 years now. We are real. Tolstoy's anarchism, I think, is relevant for us today on two fronts in particular. One, it's the way he denounces all forms of violence, and in particular the violence of the state. It's worth remembering that Tolstoy's denunciation of violence isn't targeted primarily at revolutionaries. And some people can think he's mostly criticizing, you know, Leninists and others. He's not. The primary target of his criticism are the state, the status quo. And he's very good at denouncing that and making you, I suppose, realize the extent to which you, as in most of us, are complicit in the violence perpetrated by the structures of the currently globalized political economy upon people far away or close to us, but in ways that we don't feel responsible for. So he's quite good on that. And he's quite good on the, the way 
yeah, we get deceived into it, into believing the lies of the state and the reason why the state is, into into convincing ourselves that we are not morally responsible, at least in part, for all the violence that's being perpetrated upon one another. So I think he's good at kind of helping, I suppose, unhide the violence of the globalized political economy, how widespread it is, how it happens through kind of economic relations as well as uh, through, you know, actual brute force and the violence of particular institutions. And he's good on... Um, encouraging us to admit moral responsibility for uh, this violence of the status quo and, and kind of encouraging us to desist from it, to stop taking part in that. So for those two things in particular, I think, on his anarchism specifically, as it were, he's, he's worth reading. I'm often asked what I'd recommend as an introductory text to Tolstoy, and my answer, I'm afraid, is always a bit along these lines, which is it kind of depends what tickles you already because he writes about different things and for different purposes so if you're particularly interested in i don't know church history or you know the way the church is problematic then there's some cracking stuff on his anti-clericalism there uh, you know the classic text that's mentioned is the kingdom of god is within you but it's fairly long you're talking 400 pages plus it's very good uh, it's not necessarily his best writing, I'd, I'd say, but but it, it is very good, especially on on the sort of nonviolence and the anarchism, I suppose. But there are shorter pieces on the nonviolence and the anarchism that are good too. There's some good collections that they're usually around at anarchist book fairs. Um, I don't know if I have them here. Um, kind of uh, compilations of Tolstoy's essays, and there's some available for free online. So you don't have to pick up you know, a heavy book uh, to get going. There are some pretty short essays, five pages, 20 pages, 50 pages, that are quite, you know, good introductions. And if you like the style, then quickly you'll you'll encounter some of the others. A, a lot of it is available for free online because it's kind of past copyright uh, dates by now. So I'm afraid that's the that's the honest answer. It, it, it depends what you're after. And I suppose right at the end of the book, there's, there's a whole paragraph trying to suggest, you know, what you might look at depending on what your main interests are, but it really does depend on what those are. It's interesting to see the way in which Tolstoy is linked to the Christian anarchist tradition because in a lot of introductory chapters, texts on anarchism, you know, Christian anarchism might be mentioned in passing and usually when it is, Tolstoy is the main figure that's mentioned as the main writer anyway. And yet in a lot of Christian anarchist circles, he's not necessarily the first who is mentioned. People might talk about the Catholic worker movement, Jacques Ellul, um, Dave Andrews and others. And I think that's for a number of reasons. And it was because, and it mainly because Tolstoy is an awkward person to ride along. So Tolstoy's Christianity is purely rationalistic. It's focused on morality rather than metaphysics or revelation. That doesn't fit the way many Christians see uh, their Christianity. Tolstoy's reject, Tolstoy rejects traditional dogma, such as the resurrection, which arguably is fun, foundational to one's Christianity. Uh, he rejects miracles. He rejects church rituals. He doesn't take part in them. He's not interested. He's strongly anti-clerical. And for some Christian anarchists, perhaps in particular, such as Dorothy Day, that's just too much. Um, it's, it's awkward to kind of stomach. His pacifism is particularly extreme, as I said, and whilst most Christian anarchists are pacifists, they don't necessarily follow him all the way. Um, and, and yet he's the most often uh, cited voice in sort of classic compendiums of, of anarchist thoughts. So it's not that he's not read, he is, but uh, Tolstoyan is a peculiar kind of Christian anarchist to begin with, as it were, because the Christianity is quite peculiar because of its emphasis on morality, on pacifism, and its rejection, if you're Tolstoy, of um, the church and a lot of what it stands for. And so a lot of Christian anarchists who might like Tolstoy don't necessarily take him all the way. And they might not, you know, they might not follow him on every angle, but they might still find him engaging. So he sits awkwardly in the Christian anarchist tradition, if tradition is the right word, or in the, in, 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 along the various currents of Christian anarchism. We are more than collateral. We will not build a pyre for our sisters and brothers to burn. We will not glorify our own ashes. We will plant trees and build homes and